You're listening to another episode of the Coaster 101 podcast. I'm Andrew Stilwell, and I'm joined on the podcast this week by one of the most innovative, creative, and constantly evolving companies in the amusement industry today. Please welcome to the podcast, Jeff Pike, who is the president and co-founder of Skyline Attractions, who is joined by Tyler Mullins, who is a design engineer for Skyline Attractions. Guys, how's it going? Hi, Andrew. We're really excited to be here. Yes, thank you for having us on. Absolutely. You guys are you guys are killing it right now. There's a lot of new stuff. Uh, Jeff, I know we were kind of talking offline, and you've said from the beginning of Skyline that your goal is to create a new attraction every year, and you know, you guys have done it, and we're not even in IAPA season yet, so you still have just these, you know, brand new ideas. But before I get too far off track, I want to um I want to get a little background on Skyline Attractions, and I think, Jeff, you might be the best person as the co-founder of the company to kind of talk through this. But for those of our listeners who may or may not be living under a rock, uh, are not familiar with the Skyline Attractions brand, and we do have a couple of non-theme park people who listen to this podcast because I went to college with them. So, you know, for those who might not know, what's the story on Skyline Attractions? Well, you know, when you when you introduced us, you mentioned that we're innovative and that we we want to come up with something new. And that's not just a philosophy. When uh, my partners, Evan Soulier and Chris Gray and Bill Weidra and I, we, we all founded Skyline seven years ago. One of the things that we actually codified into our founding documents, and it's in our business charter, is we are tasked to come up with at least one new idea and product that we can release every year. And, you know, at the time when we started Skyline, that that sounded like a, a fun and interesting goal. And we've been able to we've been able to keep to that so far. But I can tell you, it's a challenge to come up with a new product every single year. And, you know, I think that uh, anybody that's followed us, even from our days at Great Coasters International, which is where uh, many of us got our start, uh, you can see some of those challenges playing out, but the fact of the matter is, is we've got a team of people, you know, and Tyler's one of those folks you're going to talk to today that have really helped us stay true to our focus, to continue to innovate and to continue to push, to come up with something interesting or new. And it doesn't have to be high tech. It doesn't have to be the tallest or fastest. It's just got to serve a purpose in the market and it's got to fill a gap that we think exists in the market. And I'm just super happy that so far over seven years, we've actually been able to hit that target that's in our business charter. Perfect. And you guys, you've come up with some attractions like the Crazy Couch and the Skyline Skywarp and the Horizon. And I'm probably missing some of these, but these are these are attractions that are I want to just say is they're a little different than your typical flat ride or uh, roller coaster. I mean, is this is this something you guys just kind of you kind of pride yourselves on being a little bit different? Yeah, well, we pride ourselves on being a lot different in in more ways than one. But you're right. I mean, we don't want to just do the same thing that other people are doing and try to do it better. We're really out there trying to come up with something interesting or new. You mentioned Crazy Couch. The driving force behind Crazy Couch was what can we provide in the kiddie ride market that doesn't require a PLC, that doesn't require somebody to have knowledge of Allen Bradley ladder logic or a Siemens logic system to be able to operate a fun little children's ride. And Crazy Couch filled that because it doesn't have a PLC. There's no actual computer in that ride. It's all driven by uh, a variable frequency drive through a single motor. And all of that dynamic action that you see is achieved mechanically through a series of linkages and you know different degrees of freedom that we allow on the ride. So that's that's a great example. You know, it's not it's not super high tech. As a matter of fact, we went the other direction with it. It's a fairly low tech, but very easy to operate and understand type kind of kitty ride. Perfect. And Tyler, I I'm not going to let Jeff have all the fun here. What's uh, what's your story? How long have you been with Skyline? Yeah, so I joined Skyline as an intern in January 2018, right after I graduated from Ohio State. Uh, I was able to transition to a full-time role with the company a few months later, and I've now been a design engineer with them for over three years, which it's crazy how fast that's flown by. Absolutely. Um, what are some of the projects you've worked on with Skyline over those three years? 
Yeah, so actually before I even joined Skyline, I had the chance to work with Great Coasters as an intern in college. So that was a really good foot in the door and a good uh, sampling of some of the work Skyline now does. I had the chance to work on Mystic Timbers as well as Invader, two of their new wooden roller coasters for 2017. Uh, While we were working on those at Great Coasters, Skyline was also working on elements of those. So then when I joined Skyline after graduating, I got to work on additional Great Coasters rides such as Texas Stingray, as well as several new overseas roller coasters, as well as some of Skyline's own uh, roller coaster attractions, such as the first Sky Warp, as well as Tidal Twister. Got it. Real quick, can I just say as a fan of wooden roller coasters that what you guys and GCI did with both Invader and Mystic Timbers is absurdly good, and they're two of the best coasters I've ever been on. I just I need to just put that out into the universe. Invader, here, here. Invader <laughs> packs such a punch into such a small package, and Mystic Timbers does kind of that same thing. That's they're not Jeff. You mentioned the tallest, fastest, but. They are just both amazing, incredible wooden roller coasters. And if you're listening, have not gotten out to Kings Island, have not gotten out to Busch Gardens Williamsburg and ridden these, go ride them. Just do that because they are both so, 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 so good. I I just having the chance to talk to both of you guys, I needed to just just tell you that. It's It's okay. It's okay to geek out a little bit. We do it sometimes ourselves. Believe me. Okay, good. I feel I feel a lot better then. Um, <laughs> we can't. Our roots are, are you know coaster geeks, right? We were coaster yogis back in the day too. We 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 maintain a semi professional air about ourselves now, or at least Tyler does. I don't, but we're 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 total coaster coaster geeks all through and through. I love it. That's the that's the best. And you know, with, being the coaster geeks you are, I do want to talk about some of your your kind of new ish attractions. And um, we're going to go all the way back to IAPA 2019 at um, Fun Spot America. And Great Coasters International, as part of their 25th anniversary, uh, they unveiled the Titan Track for White Lightning at their Orlando Park. And this is kind of viewed in the enthusiast community, right or wrong, as kind of their answer to RMC. But what can you guys tell us about, you know, what went into the creation of the Titan track? Wow. I mean, that's that's a loaded question. It goes really far back. It actually goes back to right when we founded Skyline. When we were looking at, you know, one of the things, we're still very close friends with Great Coasters. We work very closely with them on their projects domestically and internationally. And we, you know, we, we, we have a fondness for them that I think is uh, most people don't realize. But when we started Skyline, one of the things that we wanted to do and one of the sort of new products that we knew that we had in, in the back of our minds was some kind of innovation in the steel coaster fabrication and manufacturing area. You know, steel coasters for so long relied on big pieces of metal that are bent and pushed and and moved into shape and welded with all this hot weld. And when they weld it with all the hot weld, it moves out of shape and changes. And then they got to have certain things done to it to move it back into shape or maintain its geometry. So we felt like there was a better way to do that. It had been on the back burner. It, it requires a significant amount of time and effort. And and when I talk about time and effort as a business owner, that translates to dollar signs for the most part. Uh, and it takes a lot of money. So when Claire, we were working on one of his wood coaster projects with them, he had mentioned to us that he was looking into a project that he was asked to do that incorporated a new type of track technology on. We adapted what we had been working on and, and, and coming up with ourselves to something that Claire could use on the wooden coasters. And it turned in ultimately to what you see on the Titan track now. And the lack of any heat input into that setup and the lack of any requirements for certified welders or non-destructive testing has really kind of changed the game, at least for Claire, you know, and, and it, it's not, you don't see it in, in seven new roller coasters a year right now, but I can tell you, the advantages of this system are are not going unnoticed to the people that make decisions in this business. That's awesome. And and Tyler, I'm going to say, you know, ask you kind of as a design engineer, for those of us who do not have a engineering background, obviously, I kind of I cover this industry, I know what non destructive testing is. But for a non engineering person, can you break it down in kind of such a way that it's 
what's going on with the Titan track and kind of how it it's it's better for wooden coasters and how it differs from what's going on? Yeah, uh, the Titan track, it's a really exciting new product because as Jeff mentioned, instead of introducing all these welds to it, which is add uh, additional cost, additional testing, we don't have to worry about those expenses and those challenges because we're able to take a sheet metal pattern and fold it into position and use rivets to construct the whole thing, kind of like zippering, close the whole track. And this opens up a lot of opportunities for more affordable coasters, for potentially uh, better quality control. And we can utilize this on both new rides as well as existing ones, which is a huge potential there. Because this, uh, if, you have, if you have had the chance to ride White Lightning, right now it's only a 55-foot section of track, which is Titan track, but it is noticeably different. It's very smooth. It's very quiet. It's very exciting just seeing what it will be able to do once we scale it up to larger attractions. Are there, are there plans right now? And you guys don't have to answer this question. Are there plans to go all Titan track on white lightning? I know the park announced that it's being closed for maintenance, but being up here in North Carolina, I have no idea exactly what's happening. Uh, that's all in uh, in the airy family's hands right now. Okay, I we will we will take that answer for what we feel to, exactly. <laughs> uh, next question, anyway. But another project you guys have worked on uh, the past year or so, also on White Lightning, was the testing of GCI's new Infinity Flyer trains. How are these different than the the Millennium Flyers that you know we've come to know and love over the years? Um, The Infinity Flyers have a lot of advantages over the Millennium Flyers, even though they may have been inspired by the old trains in a few senses, they are totally new from the ground up. They utilize a really innovative modular design, which simplifies fabrication. We limit the number of welds, which also simplifies fabrication and reduces the cost. Um, And these rides, we had the chance to test them on White Lightning, and they are... Very exciting with all the potential they have. They also have the ability to navigate tighter turns, steeper drops. They are class five, which means they can go through inversions and high intensity, zero G elements. There's just a lot more opportunities with these on both existing rides as well as new ones. Mm-hmm. And in my opinion, I think they look really, really great. Uh, great yeah. coasters had one oh, of them. They the- look totally rad. Yeah. yeah, they had them in 2018 and in 2019, and it got a lot of attention at the expo. Uh, there's also just a lot of really cool theming opportunities with these rides. So I think there's, I keep on using the word potential, but there is so much potential with these. And it's so exciting to see what they'll be used for over the next few years. Great coasters. You know, what Tyler has mentioned, just the cool look of these things. And there was a lot, there was a lot of hand wringing as we came up with the aesthetic of the Infinity Flyers. But Great Coasters has been working with uh, Lagotronics, who we've been working with as well. I don't know if you've any, had anybody from Lagotronics on before. Really innovative people in the you know lighting and theming and uh, sort of the technical aspect of rides. They've come with some really kick-ass looking, just simple things to do on these cars that really bring them to the next level aesthetically. I mean, it's just an amazing. You're gonna be really, you're gonna be really blown away when you see what Lagotronics and GCI have been working on for the IAPA cars. I'm, ex- I'm very excited. It's, I feel like I'm on the, uh, the cycle of going to IAPA like every other year. Obviously, hey, so I are we. <laughs> <laughs> So that makes that's awesome, but yeah, I'm looking at the looking at the website right now. Obviously, there's this what looks to be kind of like a cobra or a dragon train. There's a uh, kind of a tro a Trojan, um, a Volkswagen, a Volkswagen. You know, almost kind of like a DeLorean, but not really because it's a Volkswagen. But yeah, the the theming on these things looks awesome, and I just I'm ready. I just like, I'm sure you guys are to see these things kind of in real life in a fully themed immersive. It's going to be awesome. It's just, just sign me up. Just go ahead. Tell me where it's going to be. We'll talk about it right now. Break the new. I'm kidding. We're not going to be a a, a funny thing. And and you're right. There's a lot of really interesting opportunities and there's a lot of really cool themed elements. But if you, if you really look at the guts of the infinity flyer, we're still, we're still honoring the look, the, the look and the dimensions and the shape and the feel of, of some piece of wood coaster history. It, it's still there, right? But a really funny thing is, is there was a lot of back and forth and there was a lot, you know, the, the creative choices of all of the things that happen within a business. Creative choices tend to bring out the most spirited discussion. 
And Dustin Sloan, who is on the design team for the Infinity Flyers, and um, if, if you look at a lot of the, the styling of these cars, he's responsible for a lot of the styling of these cars. And I remember that you know Tyler and Dustin and I were all sitting in a meeting one time, and we had to make a decision regarding something. I, I don't even recall what it was. It had something to do with the reach envelope or some containment issue where we were limited from a functional standpoint. We had to do something. And Dustin's quote, I just remember Dustin finally after about two hours of back and forth, he kind of gave up on it. He says, you know what? I'm going to go to my office and mourn the loss of what these cars could have looked like. <laughs> you know, that's just how that's just how dedicated this team is to creating and, and holding true to, to roller coasters, you know, and it was just a it was an interesting it was sad to see Dustin kind of sulk off to his office in a sad way, but you know, it's sometimes there's things we have to do, but it's just I love the dedication of the team, you know, and I, I think watching Tyler and Dustin and Matt and Anya and, and, and the whole team just sitting and working together. It's just so cool. I just sit back and I drink whiskey and I watch the magic happen. Hey, you're the you're you're the president of the company. You're you're allowed to do that. I love it. <laughs> and I hope I do a little more than that. But, you know, in reality, that's. You always see on LinkedIn and stuff, you see the little blurbs where somebody posts something profound and hoping to get a bunch of attention to it. And one of those things is always hire people that are smarter than you. You're not, you know, you're not paying people to tell them what to do. You're paying people because they've got better ideas. You know, it's, it's true. It really is. And the people that we've hired, we've made it a point to make sure that they're all smarter than us, at least smarter than me. <laughs> all good. The last kind of new project I want to talk about uh, with you guys is the currently under construction uh, Bombay Express at Bollywood Parks, Dubai. And the reason I bring this up is there is a blurb on your website, which if you haven't been to the Skyline website recently, it's all brand new. Tyler, I think you had a hand in that, but SkylineAttractions.com, be sure to check it out. The blurb on Bombay Express says the ride features more discreet moments of airtime than any other roller coaster on the planet. What does that mean? Obviously, there's a set number here. There are discreet moments of airtime. Tyler, tell us tell us about it. What's happening here? Yeah, so Bollywood Parks Dubai, where this new ride is going to open, has been very selective on what they have shared publicly in terms of in terms of statistics and information. But they have made this claim that it will have more discrete moments of airtime than any other coaster on the planet. And that was a really fun challenge for us to build into that ride. I don't know if they've actually given the quantifiable number yet, but it is really, really great. Because, I mean, throughout the whole experience, you're going to be up and down, and up and down. And it's going to be like and it's going to be like no other coaster on the planet. And that it's going to do things that a GCI has never done before. I'm really excited for this ride to open, for more information to be shared on it. Um, I got the chance to work on it for several years. So also just having all that hard work pay off is going to be very exciting. Okay. I won't ask any further questions then because I know you guys are, you're bound by these ironclad NDAs and I get it. 100% understand. I hope one day to get out to Dubai because it sounds awesome. And the pictures I've seen look incredible. It kind of, it resembles to me, it looks like Texas Stingray a little bit, but that's just because of the steel supports and wooden track. But this thing looks, check it out if you're if you're you know listening to this podcast, stop your car, do whatever you're doing, go look up Bombay Express and find photos of this. It's just really cool. Yeah, and you know, it's 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 funny that you mentioned that uh, it, it looks kind of like Stingray. It really isn't, you know, and in in so many ways it's got such a personality all its own that I think people that ride it will be surprised if they didn't know that GCI built that ride in the beginning. I think they'll be pretty surprised and, and happily surprised. I do know that, you know, the rides actually operated. People have ridden it. Uh, Chris Gray, one of my partners was over there commissioning the ride. Uh, and he said, it's, it's, you know, there's families listening, but it was fan blank tastic, you know? So there's, there's that. Hey, I love it. And, uh, just a, a quick Coaster 101 point of business. We did an interview with Chris Gray. He did the models for the Coaster Coffee Company at SeaWorld Orlando. Built those in his cabin. Search Coaster Coffee on Coaster101.com. You'll be able to see those models in action and kind of learn a little bit more about the story. But Skyline also had a hand in those as well. So, I mean, you guys really you kind of have your hands on multiple facets of the business. And it's just without knowing that you guys are hands-on, 
you, there's so much that you guys have touched in the last seven years since being in business. It's really, again, as a fan of the industry, awesome to see. So this is, it's great for sure. A project I do want to talk about um, that's getting a little bit of press right now is Tidal Twister at SeaWorld San Diego. And this is the Horizon model from you guys. It was the first one in existence. It's had some, we'll say downtime. Um, but according to the park, you guys are working on getting it back to speed. Is that correct? Yeah, that's right. Um, we, you know, Horizon was one of those challenges that I talked about where we were really pushing ourselves to come up with something different and new. And we built on a lot of the lessons we we learned on the original Skywarp. And, you know, going back to Skywarp as the prototype for our first, you know, big attraction that was all new from the ground up, I can't say enough positive things about working with six flags you know they have for the most part they they really they really stretch their neck out for us at skyline you know and in some cases for me personally and so i you know i've got to give a shout out to six flags for going as far as they did with us and for pushing as hard as they did you know and it's always it's always disappointing when something doesn't happen the way that you expect it to in the beginning but if you dwell on that, you're never going to introduce something new every year, right? You're going to be, you're going to spend your time worrying about that. What you got to do is you learn from it. You pick up the, you know, you pick up the stuff that worked and you apply that to the next thing that you put out there. Title Twister really, and I think what a lot of people don't see on, on our side and even on SeaWorld's side was Title Twister was actually a really big success. It opened on time. It opened on budget. It was a, it was a fun experience. Now enthusiasts aren't going to be, you know, spending a thousand dollars on a plane ticket to go out. But I can tell you just from personal experience and watching the reactions of the families that would ride this for the people that would ride this as their first upside down roller coaster experience. They loved this. They loved the heck out of it. Now, we did have some challenges with specifically and, and I would attribute about 90 percent of the downtime that the ride had uh, in the early year was attributed to a specific component that we had to work with an OEM to get quickly retested and remanufactured uh, and put out on the ride. And it's an issue that didn't just affect Skyline. It affected lots of manufacturers worldwide. Uh, unfortunately, there was a lot of cameras and lights pointed at Skyline at the time. So it really looked like uh, Tidal Twister was serving a greater percentage of its time as downtime. And that really wasn't the case when you put it in into the context of what really had to happen over that month and a half. It was a Herculean effort by SeaWorld, by the, the manufacturer of this component, by our team. I mean, by the people. I mean, Matt Calabrese literally drove 6,000 miles back and forth between SeaWorld uh, and other points in the United States of America. It was a big effort. We learned a lot from it. And then when we got the ride back open, unfortunately, that's right about the time that COVID happened. They had uh, they had finished an annual teardown and they were putting the ride back together. They were getting ready to reopen it. We were all excited about it. And we were excited about lining up potential clients to go see it. And then COVID shut everybody down. And the ride sat there. The ride sat for a year. And, you know, sometimes when equipment sits for a very long time and SeaWorld, you know, to their credit, has done a really great job at really assessing, hey, what what needs to be done to get this thing back open the way it needs to be open. And we've been working very closely with them on implementing everything that needs to be implemented. You know, I, I'll have to defer to them for what their plans are as far as an actual reopening date, but it will roll again and kids are going to love it again and families are going to love it again. And we're going to sell more. I love it. I have not been to SeaWorld San Diego in a long time. And once Tidal Twister opened, it was, it immediately kind of became one of those not bucket list parks, but a park that I did want to visit again, just because I wanted to have that experience firsthand. And, you know, selfishly, you guys need to build some of these things on the East Coast where it's like you said, Jeff, not a thousand dollar plane ticket and make it a little easier for you guys in Orlando, too. I just want to I want to put that into the universe a little bit. I know you don't really have control over where the rides go, but, you know, if you wanted to sell one to an East East Coast park, it'd make my life a little bit easier. That's just All right. Tyler's on it. Tyler's going to sell one to an East Coast park. Sounds like a plan. All right. All right. Perfect. I love it. Wonderful. Go team. We're in it. Okay. I want to talk. This is actually a pretty good segue talking about the um, the Horizon model because earlier this year, a couple months ago, you guys, as I mentioned, relaunched your website. And with that, uh, you had some new announcements with that. And you had the 
announcement originally of the Orbit 2, the Horizon 2, and the Skywarp 2. How are these models different from their kind of original predecessors? So I think we took a look at the first Skywarp as well as Skywarp Horizon. We realized what went well, what maybe we could have uh, done a little differently. And we have been able to address a lot of the... I don't want to call them issues, but, you know, people oftentimes will like point at specific things that they were not thrilled about in those rides. And we've been able to tackle each and every one of those and find really great solutions to make the ride experience better, to make the viewing experience better. And we ultimately put so many improvements into these designs. We realized that these new products were worth uh, rebranding, which is how we got Skywarp 2, Orbit 2, Horizon 2, because this really is the next generation of these rides. Uh, Just to cover a few of the improvements that we have. These rides are um, they have more inclusive restraint designs, which will make them a bit more comfortable, a bit more accessible for everybody. The noise level is reduced. The comfort level is greatly increased, especially in terms of just like the smooth running. Um, the, the track design has had some improvements, which make it smoother. Just across the board, we've been able to take a lot of the lessons we've learned and a lot of the experiences that we've had to enhance these new attractions. And I'm really excited to be able to share more information once we have it ready to roll out to the public. I know thus far we've kind of just teased it with a little bulleted list of here's all these things that you're going to see. But I'm excited to be able to actually showcase those in the near future. Another big announcement for you guys, and as as far as coaster enthusiasts are concerned, anytime there's a new coaster model on the market, we get excited. You guys, again, coaster nerds at heart, you all get this. But Skyline Attraction recently announced the Paschetti Bowl. Um, children's roller coaster, and I'm hoping I've I've come very close to pronouncing that correctly. No, you got it. That's right. Absolutely. That's right. As kitty coasters go, I mean, you've got your wacky worms and your big apple coasters and the minor mics and things like that. But where did the inspiration for the Paschetti Bowl come from? Yeah. So, um, as a company, we realize that there's been an explosion in growth of family entertainment centers and small parks across the country. Over the past few years, we've had a lot of new locations like Scene 75 in the Midwest, Andretti Karting in the South, the Legoland Discovery Centers across the whole country, and many, many more. But despite the massive growth in these locations, the huge demand, the supply has been pretty stagnant. Honestly, if you are a park or FEC who wants to build an American-made children's roller coaster, your options today are almost identical to what they were in the mid-1990s. There's been very little innovation. So creating a new innovative product, new innovative product was very, very overdue. We're really excited because this, the Paschetti Bowl is a really revolutionary new children's coaster. It features a new track design, a new train design. The rides are more dynamic than our competition. They're more inclusive and accessible than our competition. And we are hoping to make this incredibly accessible for a park or a family entertainment center of any size. I I love it. That's, I love the accessibility comment and I'm I'm not naming names but I've been to several family entertainment centers and smaller parks this year and there is a certain model that is very prevalent at these locations it's shaped like an 8 and that's all we're going to say you guys again you're kind of your disruptors in the space here Tyler you mentioned this kind of this new track design and this is the first kind of single rail coaster in for children specifically, how did you guys make the decision to go with the kind of a more single rail as opposed to the, you know, traditional two rails with some connections in the middle? Like, why'd you guys go single rail here? Yeah, I think there was a lot of advantages with the single rail. Um, A big thing with our track is also that it is weld free. And the single track was honestly just kind of an effect of the weld free design. But the design of the track helps reduce the fabrication cost. It allows us to have better quality control over it, and it's going to give a smoother, better ride experience. Plus, as a single rail, that's a really, really cool aesthetic. Um, When you think of a single rail coaster, you usually think of these really big, crazy rides, but putting it in a small scale at like an FEC or a small park is a really cool thing to do. Plus, with the single rail and the monolithic design of that, we're excited because we have a lot of really cool customization opportunities. Uh, Parks can apply different thematic decals to the whole track parks have done this to trains for a long time but never to the track so having the ability to have a whole roller coaster that looks like a snake or like some um maybe like a race car track it's just a really cool opportunity 
And we think that FECs and parks are going to love that opportunity. For sure. And the, the customizations on this thing, they all fit you know, the base, there's four base models right now, and they all kind of fit under that like 35 foot ceiling. And these, especially the larger FECs, that is a, that is a vertical envelope that they all have. So this, it legitimately could go pretty much in any FEC in America. Yeah, that was one of our goals. We want to make this as accessible as possible to as many places as possible, both in terms of its price tag, as well as its size. Uh, We know that a lot of FECs and small museum parks are working with pretty, at times, small budgets or small spaces. So being able to create a great, thrilling product that they can still build, I mean, that's just a potential game changer there. Absolutely. And how's how's feedback been so far? I know it's only been a couple of weeks since you guys kind of put it out into the world, but how has um, initial feedback been? It's been fantastic. I think uh, the enthusiast community especially has been very supportive, which is always great to see. As Jeff mentioned, we're all passionate about the industry and we're all enthusiasts ourselves. We wouldn't be doing this if we didn't have a passion for the industry. So having that support is invaluable and very welcomed. Also in terms of parks and FECs, we've had a huge uh, interest in it. I'm it's- still working on a backlog of responses that I have to send out to request for more information that have been pouring in from our website. Mm-hmm. That's awesome. Yeah, it's been a fantastic rollout. We're very, very happy with it. Yeah, I think one of the most positive things that I've seen out of this, I mean, other other than the fact that I've, I've had to respond to I, I easily more than 50 over the past two days requests for pricing and information, I think one of the most personally satisfying elements of this has been as as trivial as it may seem to some, has been the reaction of the community outside of the people that are really going to buy these things, right? We're always so focused on who's going to buy these things. And we, we sort of discount the voices of the people that experience this stuff and post their honest opinions online. And good, bad, or ugly, those honest opinions that come out online are a driving force to making us better, right? I mean, if, if everybody said, like, if I go to a restaurant, if I go to Skyline Chili, and they don't put enough cheese on my coney, and they say, hey, how is everything? If I don't tell them there's not enough cheese on my coney, my coney's not going to be very good the next time I get it at that skyline, right? And I don't know if you're familiar with skyline, Andrew, but not enough cheese on the coney, that's a death knell for a skyline. You cannot operate a decent skyline franchise if you don't put the right amount of cheese. So, you know, I think there's one forum where people are just brutally honest about their experience. And that forum is online, right? People will post their opinions online. And, you know, it's a mixed bag. I hate I'm a coaster enthusiast. I love roller coasters. I know what coaster enthusiasts want. Skyline is not providing the product right now. We're not in the space that coaster enthusiasts are craving right now. We're doing something different. But the criticisms that come in, they sting. But, but it's a moment of honesty that, you know, you don't get a lot of opportunities to get that kind of real feedback about stuff. So to me, I think one of the most inspiring things about our release of the Pizgetti Coaster has been the overwhelmingly positive response rate that we've seen from the people online who are very, very good at giving their honest feedback. And if that honest feedback is overwhelmingly positive, I think we're really on to something here. Well, can I give you some honest feedback? I'm excited. Like that and I am not I am the, you know, your, you know, childless 31-year-old enthusiast and I'm wherever this ends up. Again, assuming it's travelable to me and I'm not having to get on a plane to Dubai for the first to ride the first <laughs> one. I'm excited. Like let's I hope selfishly, and I don't want to reveal anything here, I hope there's something on the IAPA show floor that you guys are ready to kind of put out there. I'm not over committing here, right? I don't think. <laughs> <laughs> With the website launch, you've announced the Orbit Horizon and Skywarp 2. You've announced the Paschetti Bowl. There's still four new attractions on your website that there is, you know, a little bit, little small blurb here and it's kind of you've you've got the names you've got hydra tower you've got the juggler you've got the boston tea party and something you guys are calling easy breezy and those are just the ones that are actually on the website oh you ought to see some of the stuff that's up on my marker board that i'm looking at right now next to me here that that the team comes up with you're not going to move that webcam right now are you not a chance. All right, fair enough. Can you give us any hints, any teases, anything other than 
There's more coming. Stay tuned. Is there anything oh, you want to give that? Just don't don't give away too much. Yeah, but you can talk a little bit about it. Um, I'm excited for all of these. I think of those four, the two which I'm most excited about, and I'll explain why, is probably Boston Tea Party and Easy Breezy. Boston Tea Party is one of our family attractions. I think the way that the little blurb on the website describes it is like being stuck in a swirling whirlpool. It's a nautical-inspired attraction. Uh, I have five nieces and nephews. They're all 12 or under, so I love great family rides that I can do with them, and Boston Tea Party is definitely going to be one of those. It's a really great, good family flat ride, which I think is going to really introduce a unique movement, which you don't really see on any flat rides at the moment. I wish I could share more than that. I wish I could kind of explain exactly what it does, but I have to keep some of the mystique. Absolutely. And then the Easy Breezy ride, that is a new roller coaster concept. And it's an interesting interactive roller coaster. Uh, it's based off, we talk about it's based off windsurfing. So if you kind of imagine how a windsurfer can navigate, can pivot mm-hmm. their board and their parasail, maybe consider how that could be used on a roller coaster. So I'll leave it at that probably. I love it. I'm I'm here for the mystique. You can't you can't reveal everything, especially on this podcast. Like, of course not. <laughs> but all four rides are really exciting, and I'm excited to slowly unveil them, just like we unveiled Paschetti Bowl. Because I think a lot of the enthusiasts are going to like them and be excited for them as well, as well as the parks and FECs. I love it. And then I've got to ask one question. This may be just the the reference that only I get, but I'm going to ask the question anyway. Does the juggler have any relation to the juggler attraction in the movie Spy Kids 2? You're here for my latest and greatest. Your personal amusement and complete gratification. I humbly offer. The juggler. I knew you were asking. Like, <laughs> um, so the juggler in Spy Kids 2 is a crazy ride that's throwing people like, you know, probably 120 feet in the air. It's not that extreme. So maybe, you know, set expectations a little lower there. But it's going to be a fun, thrilling ride. It's going to have some upside down elements to it. Okay. But maybe not as grand and, you know, humongous and concerning as the Spy Kids 2 one. Absolutely. Last time, yeah. Last time I watched Spy Kids 2, I questioned some of the... Uh, operations of that park now i'm still tr- i'm still trying to figure out a way you know that uh, i i i asked my team if they can come up with some interesting things that we can use to really put it over the top you know when people juggle what's the coolest thing that jugglers do to make it even cooler like i mean what is cooler than juggling there are very few things that are cooler than juggling but juggling things that are on fire is even cooler <laughs> I'm trying, to, I'm trying to convince Tyler and Matt and everybody to to let me set it on fire. I think we have some challenges to work through on that one, though. Just just a couple. We're going to – yeah, no flames yet. There's still time. Yet. There's, yet. It's not 2022 yet, so you guys have got your concepts for 2021. So there's 2022 on the on the horizon, so we're, we're ready for it. Flames and all. And by the way, that whole thing was actually just made up. Tyler has no idea what I'm talking about right now, but he's playing along nicely. All good. And then one last thing I do want to touch on is um, one thing that Skyline does that I feel like is somewhat unique in the industry, and that's your Sky Next program, uh, where you guys kind of you invite what I'm going to call the next generation of the industry, college kids, uh, young professionals. You invite them down to Orlando um, there's a big networking component, but why do you guys think it's so important to continue to provide for this this next generation of the amusement industry? Yeah, that, that's a great question. You know, and Tyler, I, I'll let him talk the most about it. But I mean, I think for me and Chris and Evan and Bill, uh, you know, we we wanted to get into the industry so badly when we were young, and we were looking for whatever hook we could find. We were looking for whatever bit of information we could find. I actually. Uh, at 12 years old, I contacted over the telephone for some of your listeners. You used to actually have a thing on your desk and you pick it up and there's numbers on it. You dial it and it would connect you with people on the other end. And I would constantly call people on this telephone that were worked in Curtis Summers office in Madeira, Ohio. I found out that he was the structural engineer on the Texas Giant ride back when I was in elementary school. And I called his office so many times that his secretary knew me by first name. And finally, one day she said, all right, Jeff, I'm going to let you come meet Mr. Summers. It's this picture right here. This is with me with my pudgy little belly and my red tie, and Curtis Summers with his pudgy big belly and his blue tie there. 
uh, and I met with Curtis when I was 12. I had an opportunity to talk to somebody and to hear firsthand from somebody what a strategy could be to allow some access into this incredibly competitive and tightened industry. Really, this is a small business. Most people don't realize just how small it is and how competitive it is. So being able to find a way, a pathway when you can connect with people, that was what was important to us. And that's what we wanted to offer with Skynex. Now, Tyler has been involved in quite a bit. So I'll let him really talk about some of the nuts and bolts of how it works and, and what it means. Yeah, so I had the opportunity to attend Skynext before I started with Skyline back in March 2017. That was my first chance to come down to Skyline Attractions in Orlando, meet the partners, kind of see what the company did. And I think both for myself and others, it's a really great look not only into Skyline and how it operates, but also the amusement industry as a whole. Uh, It, in the past, has included behind-the-scenes construction tours. We've toured the construction of Infinity Falls, of Mako, of Mind Blower as well as guest speakers from all across the industry. We've had representatives from Nassau, RMC, um, Maurice Piers, and others. And I think Skynext has provided a really, really cool opportunity for young professionals who may not have been able to make these connections otherwise to meet these people and to meet other people their age who have the same passion, the same interest, and the same drive. Because I know something that was heavily emphasized when I attended the event was these other students in the room with you, they are the future of the industry. So when you are working in the industry full time, like these are your coworkers, these are, you know, the vendors you're working with or you're working for. So being able to bring everybody together from an earlier stage and introduce them to this, I think is very invaluable. And I think with the industry and how it's been evolving, we've had a giant explosion of like the theme park engineering groups, of TEA groups at colleges. I think the internet's done a lot of really great things to be able to connect all these different groups. And I think Skynex is just another outlet for these potential connections. Yeah, this this kind of boom of the TPEG groups and the TEA groups, this happened for me like I was, I think, five or six years too early because I graduated college in 2012. And like the concept of a theme park engineering group, even, you know, where I was at school at North Carolina, I mean, it's... I wish it existed. And every time we talk to somebody from TPEG, and I know you were you've done some work with the uh, the TPEG Ohio State group. Every time we talk to some of these these TPEG kids, they're incredibly sharp, they're polished, and I'm so jealous of the experiences they get to have in college. And I wouldn't trade my college experience for the world. But if I had the chance to kind of network and interact with people in the industry, and you know heavy hitters such as yourselves at an event like sky next i just it would have put it over the top for me so what you guys are doing obviously from a fan perspective it looks really great that it's a kind of a giving back to the industry but i just i am so jealous of the fact that these what i'm going to call kids they're not really kids but these kids get to experience this and i'm just like kind of like wish i was born like six or seven years later but we're don't need to wax poetic about me having like a quarter life crisis at 30. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what? What's so cool to me and looking back on it, I think we've, and, and I, I'll tell you what, we miss Skynex a lot. We had a virtual Skynex event this past year, which was a lot of fun. Mm-hmm. Uh, it doesn't really compare to being together and to experiencing uh, some of the, I mean, we, it's not just a series of lectures by people either, right? We go out, we have a good time. We have fun. Uh, David Busters would sponsor our event. We've had events sponsored by Main Event. We've had restaurants donate time and food and money. I mean, it's it's been a really fantastic event socially as well. And we miss it. We desperately miss it. And we are super excited about getting back to Skynex. And I think if you uh, if you look and keep updated on our website, we're going to host the Skynex uh, this, this coming March or April if it's possible. Uh, and if it's not right in early spring, it's going to happen next year. I think that we're all committed to making it happen next year and bringing it back to in person. One of the coolest things – is being in a meeting, sitting in a meeting across from a customer that has hired us and that has entrusted us to work on a product for them. And the person who's in charge of that project on the other side of the table was a Skynex attendee years before that. That's so cool to us. I mean, it's it's just such a neat and interesting experience knowing that we've known these people for this long and we we are a small part in their continued path to success. I hope every one of these 
folks that attend Skynex ends up becoming one of our customers and demanding all kinds of stuff of us and uh, hopefully paying us a lot of money to do those things at the same time. <laughs> Uh, but you know what? We've we've even seen a lot of Skynex attendees go on to work for our competitors, which is great. I mean, they're they're finding a way in the industry, and re- regardless of what the guys at the Gravity Group might say, there's really no bad blood. They, I, I think, I probably made a really bad impression over 20 years or so with the Gravity Group guys. Uh, it was all in fun, Chad and Corey and Michael. I promise. Uh, but I, we're really friends in this business. It's kind of like a, a you know, not even a frenemies kind of thing. We're friends and. We're too close of an industry for there to be a lot of, you know, nitpicking back and forth. So we're super excited to see people get jobs, even with our competitors. I prefer to sell them our product, but hey, you know, what are you going to do? It's, these people are out there to to be successful, and we're rooting for every single one of them. That is it's so – it's refreshing. And like you said, it's a small industry. Um, so you guys can't hire everybody. You can't – everybody else – if they get a job elsewhere, they can't buy your product, so they've got to go somewhere. But I love the uh, that you're rooting for everybody. That is uh, very refreshing to hear for sure. Before I wrap this podcast up, anything else you guys want to uh, talk about? If there's any news you want to break, not really. I know we're not in the business of breaking news on this podcast, but anything else you want to talk about as it relates to Skyline, other projects you guys are working on, um, anything else that people should know about you? If you do want to be among the first to hear the breaking news, I would recommend signing up for our newsletter. We've been uh, consistently sending it out, usually the first Monday of the month for the past half year or so. That's actually how we broke the news for Paschetti Bowl, and we'll probably probably break the news for our other exciting attractions that way. And then also, come November, come say hi to us at IAPA. Uh, as we've touched on several times throughout this, Like we love roller coasters, we love theme parks, we wouldn't be doing this without that. And I know, especially for those of you, it's your first time at IAPA, maybe it's a little overwhelming, it's a little frightening to talk to people, please come talk to us. We are just people. We have a passion just like you do. And we would love to share more about Skyline and our work with Skyline with you. And if you're ever in Cincinnati, make sure that you stop by our namesake, one of the many delicious locations of Skyline Chili. They're all over the Cincinnati, northern Kentucky area. You can't miss it. You see the big blue sign, Skyline Chili. A lot of people don't realize that Skyline Attractions was named after Skyline Chili. Uh, and uh, the Pisgetti Bowl actually kind of plays a little bit on that uh, on that aspect as well. If you if you sit down at a Skyline Chili, you can order yourself a, a Pisgetti Bowl and get a delicious lunchtime, dinner time, snack time, dessert, however you want to treat it. I've done all of them in the same day. Uh, so make sure you this is this is a plug, by the way, I'm hoping that Skyline Attractions, uh, Skyline Chili's marketing director hears this and gives us a call and wants to work with us on our Skyline or Cincinnati Chili themed Pizgetti Bowl coaster for the Midwest and Cincinnati market. So Skyline Chili marketing director, if you're hearing this, if you're tuned in right now to wonder why somebody called Skyline is talking about roller coasters, there's your cue. Uh, and you can get my number from Andrew. I'm on it. I'm tagging Skyline in any sort of promotion, Skyline Chili and Skyline Attractions that I'm doing for this. Uh, this was not sponsored content, by the way, but it should be. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. Well, before we wax poetic about the different ways you can have chili on spaghetti or cheese on chili in hot dog form, uh, I'm going to go ahead and wrap this podcast up. As always, make sure you're following us on all the social medias. We are at Coaster101, wherever you can consume social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, YouTube, whatever. If you're following us, you should also be following Skyline Attractions. Uh, They are at Skyline Attracts on Twitter. They are also on Instagram at Skyline Attractions. SkylineAttractions.com is their website. Coaster101.com is our website. And we've had some good interviews over the past several years with Skyline Attractions dating back all the way till when they were at GCI. So, I mean, just go on Coaster 101, search Skyline. You're going to find some good stuff, some good interviews with um, Tyler and Jeff and Chris and Evan and all these all these other people. If you've got any questions, comments, concerns, fan mail or hate mail, shoot us an email, podcast at Coaster101.com. And on the subject of email, like Tyler said, make sure you're signed up for the Skyline Attractions newsletter. That's where they're going to break the news. At the end of every email, there is a 
picture of a Skyline Attractions employee's pet. Honestly, breaking news aside, that's one of the greatest things I've ever seen in an email newsletter. (laughs) So kudos to you guys for making that happen. If you're listening to the podcast, make sure you're liking, rating, reviewing, subscribing, telling other people to listen, telling Skyline Chili to sponsor Skyline Attractions, whatever you want to do. Thanks, as always, to Justin Mabry for our theme music. That's going to do it for this week's show. Jeff and Tyler, thank you guys so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Thanks, Andrew. It was awesome. Yes, thank you. You got it. And we will talk to you all again soon. See ya. Bye-bye.